Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that all of us eventually die. What happens to us after we die? What becomes of our bodies? Are we here in a grave or are we with the Lord? The Bible tells us that at death, the, the body returns to the ashes from which it came and the spirit goes up to God. Ecclesiastes chapter three tells us that there is a time and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain for their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. A time to grieve. Besides grieving for the dead, there are many kinds of grief and mourning that we may experience. Grieving over misfortune or material loss or suffering, or just a change of our norms or injustice may cause us grief, genuine grief. We may even find ourselves grieving in times of change when we're experiencing good things, like getting a new job or buying a home. We may be going on to better things, but still we experience a loss of what we had beforehand, or maybe just a loss of what we consider to be our normal life. And sometimes we need to allow ourselves to grieve, to actually recognize our grief and give ourselves space to grieve. The Bible recognizes such grief as a legitimate human experience. But this morning I want to focus on grief as it applies to death. There is a time to mourn and people need to mourn. We're going to talk about that today, but before we do, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word today, we pray for those who grieve. We pray also, Lord, that for a reminder of the hope that you have given to us. We come to your word to be reminded of your promises, for we know that your word is more than print on a page. It's more than words in a book. It's more than histories or rules. By your word, you make yourself known to us. And so we pray that you would make yourself known to us in this time and fill us with the hope that can only come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Throughout the ages, people have expressed their grief over death through various forms and customs, from the elaborate pyramids and mummification of the pharaohs to the simple wrapping and embalming of the body of a loved one. A hundred years ago, the family would wash the bo body of their loved one and, and prepare it for, for uh, viewing 
and dress them, and it gave them time to come to terms with their grief. They would build their own coffins. They would bury their own dead. Each of these customs gave people time with the body of the deceased to, to come to the grips, grips with the fact that they really were gone, that, that they really were dead. Today, we often have a viewing where people can come and see the body and say their final goodbyes. At these events, people have an opportunity to personally interact with loved ones and honor the memory and the life of the person who died. It gives them a chance to come apart and take time for grief in a culturally acceptable way. And while it is a time when tears are appropriate, it's also a time when laughter is fitting as we remember a funny or, or precious memory that we shared together. I've known a number of people who, after they died, specified that they did not want a funeral or any service of remembrance. They thought that they were sparing their loved ones from having to grieve. Instead, they caused deeper grief because there was no outlet for them to cope with their loss. Because I live far away from my family, I've had a number of relatives who have passed away and it was too far away to travel. So I have trouble remembering if that person is actually alive or dead because I have no way to come to grips with the loss. It just doesn't seem real. Many families are helped to work through their grief by preparing a collage of pictures or a slideshow video of a person's life which they worked hard to find the elements and to put them together in a meaningful way. And the process itself is an opportunity to remember and to work through the grief that they're feeling. That's especially helpful when the person who has died has been in an accident or is cremated and there is no body for a viewing. I know that all this seems rather morbid to some people. But morbid is a word that refers to that which is deathly. And it is forbidding because it's death itself. But death is real. And it's the very thing we're dealing with. And it's best to deal with it openly. We need to be able to process it. Children need to be able to grieve as well. Sometimes families want to shield their children from death. And they keep them away. But children are feeling the loss very deeply and they, they need the freedom to, to cry, to express their fears and to talk about what happens to people after they die. This may be the first time in their young life when they've come to the realization that they themselves may die someday. Children also need guidance to help them move on from grieving and to return to their regular habits. They can easily get stuck in the depths of grief. They need to know that life goes on. They need to be assured that the deceased person would want them to go on to live a happy and full life, not to spend their lives in sadness or despair. They need to know that they will see their loved one again in heaven and that it's okay to miss them. But it's also okay to go on with their life and live it in a way that honors the memory of the person they loved. They need to be involved as much as they would like to be involved. And they need to be able to back away when they need to because they feel overwhelmed. We need to note that observances of grief are for the living. They're not for the dead. They have no more grief or suffering if they're with the Lord. As a pastor, I always meet with a family when I'm preparing for a funeral or a memorial service. And while I'm with them, we talk about the person and the memories of the life that they shared. While that does help me in my comments that I might make during the service, especially if I don't know the person, I firmly believe that it's a healthy practice for the loved ones because it enables them to think about the person. It removes the taboo. It allows them to remember the life that they shared together, even to begin to celebrate the good times that they had together. Talking and remembering is a healing process. When a person dies, there is a flurry of arrangements and decisions and planning for the handling of the body and hosting of the family and the funeral itself or memorial services, a reception to follow. 
And sometimes all that can be overwhelming. And that's when a person does need a lot of support from other people. But then, in a matter of days, all the ceremony is done. Those who visited have gone back to their homes and their lives. And that's when the real mourning begins. That's when the pain of loss really hits. That's when the silence becomes deafening and the heart melts. And that's often when the chief mourner is forgotten. People bring food, they check on them, and everything else, when everything else is happening. But when everything is done, we still need to remember them and support them in their grief. The loss of a spouse or a child can take months or even years to process. Now, that's perfectly normal. People often wonder, why am I still not able to get over my grief after so long a period of time? The truth is, we never stop feeling our loss, but we do develop new norms, and life eventually does go on. The more we try to shortchange our grief, the more it will linger on. We can't stuff it. We have to express it. We need to, which takes different forms for different people. Weeping, fasting, sackcloth and ashes, running around the house screaming, praying, talking to the deceased, anger with God, anger with the loved one for leaving, support groups. Grief is not always rational, but it is always real. After the loss of his wife, Joy, to cancer, C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest theological minds of the 20th century, struggled with his loss. And he expressed his raw grief and his questions to God, which you can read because he recorded them all in a book called A Grief Observed, which I think is very helpful for people as they're grieving. It's open and honest with the feelings and thoughts that believing Christians still experience fully, even though they are not grieving without hope. When grief is deepest, it's not the time to make major decisions or to bring about major changes in our lives. People need time to figure out what life is going to be like without their loved one. They're not thinking clearly when grief clouds the mind, and those around them should encourage patience. Job records, My eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. When our vision is clouded by grief, it's best to hold off on any drastic changes in our lives, which we may regret later. Grief is a source of great stress. Grief is exhausting. Even if you don't seem to be accomplishing anything but grieving, it takes a physical toll on a person. It causes mental and emotional anguish and physical fatigue. And weeping is a natural channel for grief to express itself and to process. There is a time to weep. The psalmist brings his grief before the Lord, saying, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Sometimes people think that handling grief well is keeping a stiff upper lip and stuffing our emotions. Nothing is further from the truth. We need to weep. Some people need time alone to be able to allow themselves to fully feel their loss and to weep over it. Some need the support of loving arms to come around them and hold them up and allow them to fall apart. But sometime, somewhere, grieving people need to weep. Stuffing the emotions of great loss causes all kinds of negative repercussions. It's not the time to pretend to have it all together. It's not the time to be strong. Death makes all of our lives fall to pieces. And we may have to rebuild those lives a piece at a time. A person recovering from grief needs to allow themselves and to be allowed by others to take it one step at a time. They may not be up to participating in everything they were doing before. 
Holidays can be extra stressful and gift giving and activities need to be scaled back for a time. Social gatherings will be difficult at first as a person has to learn to navigate alone. And that may mean showing up late or arriving early or both. And if we are to mourn with those who mourn, we also need to encourage and support the grieving with understanding and space. Psalm 88 laments, I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all of your waves. Down in the dumps, in the pit, without strength, in the darkest depths. These aptly describe the despair of grief. Waves that overwhelm are often the dread of the grieving because they never know when the next wave is going to hit. When a person just begins to feel like they're recovering, something hits them and they, they find themselves falling apart all over again. That can be embarrassing. Months after losing a loved one, something triggers a memory and, and you find yourself weeping in the middle of a gathering of people and you have to excuse yourself. It happens a couple of times and you're hesitant to even go out because you don't want to be caught like that. You don't trust yourself. But it's completely normal. And people generally understand grief takes time. Memorial services and funeral services give us a setting in which to reflect on the life that was taken from us and to be reminded of the hope that we have of eternity. For Jesus Christ has overcome the power of sin and death by his own death and resurrection and gives eternal life to all who come to him in faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Paul reminds us of our hope in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians, in the passage which was just read for us, in that he recognizes the need to mourn. Yes, Christians mourn. But we do not mourn like those who have no hope. We mourn the loss of a person who was dear to us. We miss their presence with us in this life. We mourn over the unfairness and sadness and suffering of death. But while we do mourn, we cling to hope. Hope for the deceased and hope for ourselves as well. We know that those who die in Christ, they go to a better place for they go to be with God. And we know that someday Jesus will return to take us to the place that he's prepared for us, a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, a place where suffering and death and injustice and decay no longer exist because the curse of sin and death is gone. A place where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more grief. Because of our hope, we can rejoice for the gain of the person who has gone to be with God. The Bible tells us the righteous perish, and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. At the same time, we grieve over our loss in this life at the present time. And we share in the grief of others. The Bible tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus wept. He himself mourned over death. When Jesus was carrying his cross to Golgotha, women wept for him. When Mary brought the news to the disciples of the resurrection, she found them three days after his death. She found them together, still weeping and mourning. There is a time to grieve. There is a time to weep. When Job suffered the loss of his children, his flocks, his herds, and his health, his three friends came to grieve with him. 
Now, while the advice that they would give him later on was really not all that helpful, one thing that they did get right was sharing the grief of their friend. They took time to travel and to be there with him in person to support him in his grief simply by being there. This is what we read in Job chapter 2 when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Grief can effectively make us stop living. After a time, we need to move on and take hold of life again. We need to leave our loved ones in the care of the Lord, and to go on and serve the Lord ourselves by living a full life again. There is a time for everything. There's a time to heal, a time to build, a time to laugh, a time to dance. That can be a struggle for the grieving. They don't want to dishonor the memory of their loved one. They don't want anyone to think that they would forget them. They sometimes need to be reminded that their loved one would want them to go on with a full and happy life because they did love them. So where is God in all this? Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God does not willingly cause grief or desire death. Lamentations tells us, though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. God wants what's best for all of us and has our ultimate good in mind. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all would come to repentance and turn to him to have life. As Peter wrote, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And God does not leave us alone in our grief. God promises to help us overcome grief. He says, I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. Having experienced that, David exclaims, You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Yes, there is a time to mourn, but the time to laugh and sing again will return. This morning, I want to thank you, our congregation, for allowing Kim and I some time this week to travel and process our grief following the death of Kim's mother. Sally was not someone who loved the Lord. She kept us at a distance because she resented our faith in God. Because of this, our mourning is even deeper because we are not sure of what to hope for Sally. She knew about God but refused to repent and believe in Jesus or to trust in his death and resurrection. Even when she was visited in her last days and reminded of the gospel, our only hope for her now is that somehow in the last days of her life, she may have turned to God in faith. The Bible says if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our grief 
is a reminder of the urgency of the gospel. It's not just good news for sinners. It's vital news for everyone. For people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. There is an acceptable time to come apart to mourn. There is also a time to repent and to turn to God. And that time is today, right now. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. The Apostle Paul proclaims, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. God holds the door open to all who will come to him in faith through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son. But the day is coming and will soon come when that door will be closed and it will be too late. Then those who mourn, those who have rejected God's gift of grace will find no comfort or relief forever. Jesus declared, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the peoples on earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And John envisioned that day, saying, Look, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. As was read in our scripture this morning, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. None of us knows the day of our death. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. It could be today. We're told to be ready any day. And the only way to be ready is to trust in him to turn away from our sins and to live in obedience to his word. Are you trusting in Jesus today? Do you know him? He who died for our sins and was raised from the dead lives forever. He is coming again. Will he find you in faith? Will you welcome him because your sins have been taken away and you're prepared to live in the presence of a holy God because you've been cleansed from unrighteousness? Or will you be left mourning when he returns because you have rejected God's love and are left in sin and guilt to face judgment? Our hope of being reunited with loved ones who have died before us rests in our hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus, who was raised as the firstborn among many. He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to eternal life. He is the truth. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. That if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving. And even more, Lord, we pray for all of us in those times of grief that you'd remind us of the hope that we have, that we would be able to turn to you and find comfort in our times of grief and hope for the future. Lord, remind us in those dark times of our lives, whether we're suffering from a loss or some other thing that puts us in the pit of despair, we pray, Lord, that you'd remind us of your promise that what happens to us, those trials that we undergo are, are common to other people and that you are faithful and that you will not let us be tested or tempted or tried beyond what we can bear, but will always provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. Help us always to look to you to bring us through those times. Help us to regain our lives 
Turn our mourning into dancing. Take away our sackcloth and clothe us with joy. Lord, we do pray for those who are without hope, that they would truly hear the message of the gospel that proclaims hope to all people, for no one who comes to you will ever be put to shame. We pray that even now, if people are listening to this and hearing your word, Lord, that they would trust in you as their Lord and Savior, that they would find hope for the future and joy for today. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.